All right, Damien, you're not by any chance the attorney on the tiny house bill, are you? I sure am. So, oh, would you like to stick around? I was going to ask if you wanted me to stick around uh, since my, my schedule just opened up. Sure, I'm happy to. Absolutely. So, um, Representative Christie, are you here? I, I hope it's the right room. <laughs> Well, it's an it's it's old home day today. <laughs> Representative Morrissey and now Representative Christie is uh, House General alums who ducked out of the committee years ago now, but is is ensconced in the Judiciary Committee. So, um, you have a bill with us that's on H tiny houses H three forty seven. Yeah. So, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, this is uh, Representative Kevin Coach Christie, for the record. Uh, the bill that uh, we're talking about today um, is, um, uh, we're calling it the Tiny House Bill. And, um, you know, what, what spurred uh, my interest is uh, the number of... Um, you know, our age children that uh, are looking at, you know, smaller accommodations and uh, the traditional um, multi thousand foot square foot homes um, uh, isn't really what they're interested in, or at least uh, it, uh, you know, it appears, um, you know, having it function and have the functionality of kind of, a, it's almost like a Swiss army knife uh, home. Uh, I, I've watched some of the, uh, uh, the construction programs, you know, about uh, tiny homes. And it's just fascinating uh, the amount of uh, accommodations that can be fitted into a much smaller space. Um, so, so that being said, thinking about um, options for uh, our young uh, Vermont um, uh, family members to be able to return and be able to return in a way that, that works for them. Um, the, the whole notion of uh, tiny houses and um, having very clear uh, regulations around how they would function um, uh, so it doesn't just turn into a, a big uh, uh, campground parking lot type of situation uh, seemed to make sense. So, so that's the, the uh, over, overall genesis uh, of the bill. Um, Damien, thank goodness, was able to stay and uh, he drafted the actual language of the bill. Uh, and it, it parallels a lot of the work that they're doing in New Hampshire as well, uh, because they've been uh, looking at that uh, prospect uh, like the rest of us. Uh, so it seems to be a uh, kind of an, a national uh, uh, occurrence. So, so that's, that's the Cliff Notes version of, of the thinking. All right. Thank you. We like cliff notes sometimes, <laughs> especially because Damien's here to take us through the bill. Um, yeah. So, thank um, you, Coach. Thank you. I'll go ahead and give you guys the uh, annotated version here. Um, <laughs> if, if, if that was the cliff notes there. Um, Do you have volume? screen here can you hear me okay oh sorry my microphone was was in the wrong spot there you go um i uh i stood up and stretched in between here so there we go um so let's uh this bill is um speaking of swiss army knives uh this bill is in many ways like uh that Swiss army knife that always looks appealing in the store, but then you can't figure out how to carry it because it has so many tools on it. 
Um, so it, that this bill, because uh, housing touches on so many different parts of our statutes, as I know this committee is aware, this bill, uh, just like that, touches on a number of different things. Uh, it starts off um, with the building and safety codes. Uh, so the first thing that it does is, and this is in the uh, provisions around um, fire safety and building and safety codes. Uh, and it provides that all codes and rules adopted by the Commissioner of Public Safety uh, would apply to owner occupied, uh, that apply to owner occupied single family residences would also apply to tiny houses. So in other words, uh, you have to meet the same code requirements in terms of building and safety codes as you would for a single family home. Um, and then it defines a tiny house to mean a structure that's intended for year round occupancy that contains facilities for sleeping, eating, cooking and sanitation and is either constructed on a permanent foundation or on a trailer or semi trailer. Uh, as those terms are defined pursuant to our transportation law and has not more than 400 square feet of floor area, excluding any lofts. So it establishes the footprint, uh, which is for maximum of 400 square feet. This distinguishes it from uh, a mobile home, which has a minimum of 900 square feet. So this is, is uh, less than half the size of that. The uh, trailer and semi-trailer requirements, um, that relates to, uh, and I can't remember the exact definitions, but it relates to basically how uh, the trailer rides and whether it, it requires the support of a, of a um, vehicle to stay upright um, or something else underneath it. So, um, and again, I cannot remember the exact provisions there. And then the, the facilities for sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation just basically require that uh, it distinguishes this uh, in some ways from some camping trailers, which may not have facilities for sanitation, for example, uh, and also requires that this be a self-contained living arrangement here. Um, so it also provides that uh, a tiny house built on a trailer or a semi-trailer, so in other words, one that could be towed on the roadway, uh, meet the requirements of our transportation laws related to tra trailers and semi-trailers, uh, and uh, be secured in a manner that is approved by the traffic committee, which is, I believe, the secretary of transportation, the commissioner of motor vehicles, and the commissioner of public safety. Um, and then, uh, but again, that, that is set out, uh, defined by statute. Um, and this committee addresses these rules of the road uh, as far as vehicle safety uh, and road safety. Um, and this, this basically, the goal of this requirement here is to make sure that if you have a tiny house that can be towed, transporting it from one location to another is not going to endanger other people on the road. Um, so that, that's sort of the basic requirements there is it has to meet uh, the building code. It has to meet certain minimum requirements as far as uh, the living facility to be called a tiny house. And if it is mobile, it, it has to be able to be transported safely on the roadways. Uh, the next sections here uh, relate to the electrical code, uh, and it just reply, requires that, again, uh, electrical rules and code provisions adopted by the electrician's licensing board that apply to single family dwellings would also have to apply to tiny houses, and it uses the same definition that we just created in Title 20. The next section here uh, relates to the, the plumbing code. Again, rules and code provisions adopted by the board that apply to single family dwellings would also have to apply to tiny houses. Um, and within all three of these, I just wanna note that uh, if the committee moves forward with this bill, I would recommend getting testimony from each of these bodies regarding whether you should add in language 
uh, to permit um, these uh, the boards or the division of um, fire safety to adopt specific exemptions or alternate requirements for tiny houses, uh, understanding that there may be differences uh, in, for example, how you would safely plumb a tiny house versus uh, a traditional home. Um, and I, I don't have the expertise to know that. Um, so this is starting from the point of everything should have the same requirements. Um, the next provisions here with municipal zoning, um, this provides that uh, a code or regulation adopted um, pursuant, uh, a basically a municipal zoning code or regulation uh, that applies to single family dwellings would also have to apply to tiny houses uh, and that no municipal zoning code or regulation uh, could have the effect of excluding tiny houses except if it's on the same terms and conditions as conventional housing is excluded. So for example, if there is a setback requirement for uh, traditional housing, that would also have to apply to tiny houses. And by the same token, you couldn't exu uh, exclude tiny houses from a district unless you were also excluding other forms of dwellings from that district. For example, if you've created an industrial district where uh, residential dwelling is prohibited, or you have uh, a district in your zoning uh, regulations where nearly all development maybe is prohibited because of the nature of the district, uh, wetland, flood zone, something like that. Um, the next section here, section five, is just a definition section providing that the same definition of tiny houses is adopted in Title 20 applies. Uh, section six uh, deals with required provisions and prohibited effects in uh, zoning codes. Uh, and it we're adding to the provision here that currently prohibits any zoning bylaw from having the effect of excluding mobile homes, modular housing, or prefabricated housing we're adding tiny houses to that list. Um, and then uh, with the proviso that a municipality can establish site-specific standards to regulate uh, mobile home parks uh, and tiny house parks with regard to the distances between structures and other standards necessary to ensure public health, safety, and welfare. Um, provided they don't have the effect of prohibiting the replacement of uh, those structures. Um, and then no bylaw can have the effect of excluding mobile home parks or tiny house parks from the municipality. Um, and then again, we're applying the same uh, provisions related to non-conformities in mobile home parks. So non-conformity is, is where uh, for example, the municipal zoning bylaw is updated to say that the setback has to be 20 feet. Uh, and previously when that park was established, the setback was 10 feet. And so now the structures are 10 feet apart and they no longer conform uh, to the, the bylaws. So if you have a pre-existing um, non-conformity, what we're saying is that the, the structures in the mobile home park um, or uh, the tiny house park, you have to look at it on a, a park wide, um, from a park wide lens so that you don't prevent uh, lots within that park from being developed if the park was previously permitted. Again, this is preventing municipalities from uh, regulating uh, mobile home parks and what we would add tiny house parks out of existence through changes to their zoning bylaws um, that gradually hollow out the park from the inside. Uh, the next provisions here, um, what we're adding here is uh, we're adding tiny houses to the uh, provisions regarding the purchase and sale of mobile homes. So we have a whole chapter um, in our 
cover, uh, title governing commerce that provides protections and re uh, requirements around the sale and purchase of mobile homes. We're adding tiny houses to that. Um, the idea being that tiny houses uh, are very similar, particularly in that they could be located on leased land like a mobile home and a mobile home park. Uh, and so we're adding in section seven, uh, section seven that the purchase and sale requirements, tiny house is included in the definition of mobile home. And then within the requirements around mobile home parks in title 10, uh, we're adding tiny houses to those same requirements so they're treated identically again. Uh, and so what section eight is, is just updating those definitions to bring tiny houses and the concept of a tiny house park um, or a park owner owning either a mobile home park or a tiny house park into that statute. Um, and then we're adding a section governing tiny house parks that provides uh, in section nine here that the provisions of this chapter shall apply to tiny house parks, tiny house park owners, tiny house park residents, and leaseholders in tiny house parks in the same manner as they do to their equivalent in a mobile home park. Section 10 gets into taxation. Uh, so sale or transfer of mobile homes, and we're adding tiny houses to this statute. Uh, and providing that the transfer of ownership in a mobile home uh, or a tiny house, uh, the taxes around that are going to be the same, um, including the requirements around a uniform bill of sale uh, provided under Title IX. Um, and so again, throughout here, we're just adding or tiny house um, so that the requirements are identical. Um, and then uh, the section 11 uh, relates to when there is a tax sale to acquire land um, uh, following a delinquent tax uh, issue. Um, and it basically provides the same provisions uh, for extending that tax warrant to a mobile home on the, uh, in a mobile home park as it would be to a tiny house uh, in a tiny house park. Um, <clears throat> and then in uh, again, Uh, so 10 VSA 6248C, I believe, uh, is, so this relates to the collection of, um, of taxes here. And um, I, I gotta be honest, I have to check back as to what 6248C ref refers to, but again, we're extending the same requirements here for uh, mobile homes and tiny house parks. Sorry, this is what happens when I do a walkthrough without preparing ahead of time. Um, but I, I will get back to you on what that requirement is. The, the key point here is that again, um, when they're extending a warrant for a uh, collection of delinquent taxes here, and there's been a uh, notice provided pursuant to the mobile home, home park law, or in this case, what would become also the tiny house park law, um, the collector would uh, commence tax sale proceedings within a set time after receiving that notice. Um, the next section here includes uh, tiny house in the definition of homestead for purposes of the homestead property tax exemption. Um, and then uh, the um, section 14 is the section where we have to set out the statutory purpose of tax exemptions. Um, so um, 
The capital gains credit, which is created in section 15 is what we're referring to here. And we say that it's to encourage sales of mobile home or tiny house parks to a group composed of a majority of the mobile home or tiny house park leaseholders or to a nonprofit organization representing those groups. So as some of you will be familiar with, or maybe all of you, uh, I'm not sure how what you've done with David on tiny or on mobile homes this year. Uh, we do have a provision uh, in the law that allows uh, an organization of the the owners of the homes within a mobile home park to purchase that park from the mobile home park owner when they want to sell, uh, in order to protect the land that their their houses rest on. Um, and so, like I mentioned before, Section 15 here is including tiny house parks in that uh, capital gains credit for those sales back to the owners of the homes in that park. Uh, section uh, 16 here uh, relates to uh, computing the property tax credit for the owner of a mobile home and we're adding again tiny houses to that. Uh, and section 17 uh, is excluding the retail sales um, or excluding from the sales and use tax um, the um, the forty percent. Yeah, forty percent. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just wrapping my head around the language here. Um, again, uh, so 40% of the receipts from the sales of mobile homes uh, and tiny houses here, uh, when they are sold as tangible personal property is excluded from the sales and use tax. Um, and then uh, the in section 18, we're excluding from the definition of land, land comprising a mobile home or tiny house park uh, that is transferred in a single purchase to a group um, consisting of the owners in that park. So uh, again, this is for excluding uh, tax exclusion here to encourage that transfer. Uh, and then section 19 would require conforming revisions to be made um, when uh, ledge council makes revisions throughout title 32 as needed for consistency uh, with section eight of this act by substituting a mobile home or a tiny house as defined in 20 VSA 2731 for a mobile home and any other revisions that are substantially similar. Um, and then the effective date is July 1. So uh, I will say that I worked closely with Abby Shepard from our office on drafting the tax sections. Uh, so if you have questions about those tax provisions, I am not our tax attorney, so I would really strongly encourage you to talk to Abby uh, on those issues because she's much more aware of the ins and outs of the various um, complications of property tax. Uh, and of course, I imagine if, if this bill does move forward, uh, your Ways and Means Committee would be interested in taking a look at those with Abby as well, just to, um, consider what the potential implications would be. Um, but as I said from the beginning, what the idea was uh, with this bill is to put tiny houses on the same footing as single family homes. Um, and then in instances where there's a distinction between uh, what I'll call a traditional single family home and a mobile home, to put tiny houses on the same footing as mobile homes because of their similarity uh, in the way they can be sited on leased land very easily or potentially moved from one location to another before they're fixed to the ground. Um, so I see there's questions. Uh, yeah, them. Representative Trotter. When um, you spoke of um, safety equipment, if these uh, tiny houses are, uh, are mounted on trailer frames or wheels, um, is that, um, is it <coughs> That would be lights and brakes and uh, and things like that would be required under that section. It, it's um, 
it's, uh, it is anticipated that that would be along those lines. Uh, requirements for um, the construction of the trailer, how the tiny house is fixed to the trailer, uh, safety lighting, brakes, um, weight limitations, et cetera. Um, and uh, again, um, Anthea from our office is our, our expert on transportation issues. Um, so I can, uh, if there are more detailed questions, I can pass them on to her. Um, or you may wanna hear testimony from, for example, um, the Agency of Transportation or Department of Motor Vehicles regarding what those requirements would be. And, um, you know, and, and it, it is important to note that this bill uh, does require them to conform with certain statutes, but it also gives some discretion to uh, the Transportation Committee to adopt additional requirements that might be unique to tiny houses. Um, and I, I can't say what those would be, but um, just, you know, with the idea of, of taking a, a framed living structure down the highway, um, there, there obviously may be some unique uh, considerations and requirements in the same way there are for mobile homes. Representative Parsons. Thanks. Yeah, I just had a question about, um, you said that this is kind of bringing them in line with a single family home or a mobile home. Um, but certainly there are a lot of these that are designed to go down the road and they're used as campers really, as well more in that vein, I guess you'd say. Does this address any of that or does this? Uh, so this doesn't, um, this doesn't address the idea of using uh, a tiny house as a camper. Uh, the, our transportation law uh, already does address camper trailers. Um, and so uh, it may be something that would be left up to rulemaking as to how to distinguish between uh, a tiny house that, for example, is seasonally brought to a property that's used as a camp uh, by a family uh, and, then, um, and then towed somewhere else uh, in a, you know, when the weather becomes unseasonable there, maybe they, they move it to a different property in a more temperate part of the country. Um, versus uh, one that gets um, fixed to the ground in the way a uh, mobile home would be where you're, you're connected up to a, a septic tank and so forth. Um, I believe um, that there are some requirements around sanitation for camper trailers. Um, and I, I don't know how you would draw the line necessarily between a tiny house uh, that needs to be hooked up to, for example, a, a septic system versus a camper trailer that would have an onboard tank for uh, wastewater that can then be um, deposited periodically in a, a septic disposal facility. Yeah, thanks. That was just one of my, while I was listening to it, I was kind of trying to get around the idea of how unintentionally we might wrap up these into a mobile home unit when it's really not the intent of the owner. Um, yeah, and I, I th think um, this is one of the policy questions that the committee, if, if you move forward with this bill, um, that you'll need to grapple with is, uh, where do you draw the line on, on tiny house versus um, some other forms of, um, you know, dwellings? Uh, and uh, are there complications that you need to either leave up to rulemaking or that you can address through statute uh, and so forth? And I think this is one of the things that um, jurisdictions around the country as they've been trying to address tiny houses have been kind of grappling with is um, because of the unique nature of the homes where uh, for uh, a portion of their life or all their life, they could be fixed at one spot, but in other instances, you may see a tiny house that moves either seasonally or, um, you know, moves uh, every couple of years as it, it changes owners. And I, I don't want to speak for Coach Christie, but I think his idea is, is to address 
tiny houses that are used as housing um, rather than something that's used. And he's not trying to wrap up things that are used as uh, campers uh, or something like that, like a recreational vehicle, for example. I, I, would, I would say that that's the, uh, the general thinking. Um, when we think about um, properties, you know, like here in Vermont, for example, um, if we had a child that wanted to come back, you've got four acres of land and um, it's just your son and daughter or, um, you know, as a couple, uh, not really um, looking to be uh, that mobile, uh, but uh, families move a lot more now, uh, but the hope would be they might move back home home and then maybe look for a piece of property, you know, either, you know, in the kingdom or what have you that, uh, that they might move it to for even a more extended, you know, period. And as we get more connectivity, the likelihood of needing to be in a certain area, just, you know, it's, you know, there's no confines anymore, you know, because, you know, and we've seen that, you know, especially with COVID, um, where there is connectivity, employers have said, hey, you know, the, the, the model is changing. All right, Representative Hango. I thought I had a question, but I'm actually not thinking that um, it's easily answered. So I'm going to wait for further testimony on it. I appreciate it. There's a lot more to think about on this than I thought mm -hmm. there would be. Um, also, I regret I have another meeting, so I need to leave. So thank you, Coach. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Damien, a quick question for me. What is the relationship in this legislation, at least right now, from um, tiny houses as ADUs? So um, this legislation, uh, I've stayed away from amending the accessory dwelling unit uh, law, knowing that that um, can be a uh, uh, just a, uh, an issue that generates a lot of discussion, um, but nothing would prevent a tiny house from being used as an accessory dwelling unit uh, with the way this is drafted. If you look at the definition of accessory dwelling unit, and it's, uh, it's been a couple months since I looked at it, but it's something I, I worked at uh, or worked with somewhat regularly in my career before the legislature. Um, it's, it's uh, defined as a dwelling unit that is, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember what the word is, but basically uh, is um, secondary to the main unit. It's um, subordinate to is, is the way we phrase it. Um, so clearly subordinate to the main unit. And I think if you have, for example, um, to take a variation on Coach Christie's example here where um, you know the parents have uh, a property here in Vermont their child wants to move back but doesn't want to live in the same house wants their own space the parents could very easily set up a tiny house in the way uh, you've seen this happening increasingly on the west coast with um, municipalities having to address backyard tiny houses uh, where because the housing costs are so high in some of the cities out there parents have set up a tiny house in the backyard for their children so their children can get established uh, and have affordable housing but and they're taking advantage of accessory dwelling unit laws out there uh, to set up the tiny house as an ADU in the backyard uh, meeting all of the requirements for sanitation and so forth um, but using the tiny house which is a more affordable um, alternative to uh, for example, a traditional stick built accessory dwelling unit on that property where you need to dig and pour a foundation or a slab uh, with frost protection and so forth. Um, so, um, and in this case, I think the short answer after that long and rambling explanation is 
<laughs> that uh, there's nothing that prevents them from being used as an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and so they, they would be brought into that conversation. Okay, Representative Walsh. Uh, thank you. I don't remember hearing anything in your walkthrough that addressed this, Damien. Uh, but the mention of families made me think, okay, what if uh, it's a couple who has a tiny home, they have a baby, and they decide to add a bedroom, and it's no longer bigger than 400 square feet, and it's just a single family home. I don't remember anything you said that would cause a problem. So I, I don't see any reason why that would create a problem. Um, obviously, if you're going to expand your tiny home in the same way that if you expanded a, um, you know, a, a small seasonal cabin or something into a more permanent residence, you'd have to comply with building code and zoning requirements uh, as you do that. I think the tiny house owners could potentially see some construction complications around that um, with the expansion. Um, but I think what you would basically see is, uh, you know, that they may run into some complications around expanding the home and bringing it out of that tiny house definition. But there's nothing that prevents them from doing it. They may just need to take some special steps to, uh, you know, um, to mate that structure to the expansion of it in terms of um, maybe putting a more permanent foundation under the tiny house or something. But legally, there's nothing preventing them from doing that provided they can comply with uh, the code and zoning requirements for uh, their location and, and what they're planning to do. All right, any further questions right now for Coach or Damien? All right, well, thank you for introducing the bill and doing the walkthrough. Um, well, thank Coach, you. thank you for handing us something that seems so simple and plain that we can pass it tomorrow. But um, <laughs> I always love when we mix housing and mobile homes and automobile law and <laughs> tax law and that's the Vermont way it just takes a couple Mr. days Chair. <laughs> um, Representative Murphy I was going to jokingly say if I was still next door to you I'd be knocking on your door saying what are you doing with my title <laughs> <laughs> it's right. just a tiny title you're right right <laughs> it's a subtitle <laughs> That's uh, a good one. I like that one. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. We're going to call it a day. We have a Thank you. long day tomorrow ahead of us. Um, we'll meet back here in the morning. And then we have JRH2 on the floor tomorrow. Um, so enjoy the day. I'm going to go take a walk for a change. It's been a couple of weeks, it seems. Mm -hmm. So.